To make a donation, visit biblicallycorrectpodcast.org slash donate. And if you enjoy this episode, please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Thank you for your support. What's the number one source for understanding the Bible? Welcome to the Biblically Correct Podcast. Shalom, y'all. This is the Biblically Correct Podcast, teaching biblical correctness in a biblically incorrect world. My name is Kevin Jeffrey. I'm a Jewish follower of the Messiah Yeshua, Jesus, and I love teaching the scriptures. The Bible, the written word of God, is perfect and true. But sometimes it's not exactly easy to understand. So when we come to a word or concept that we don't quite get, or it seems contradictory or inconsistent, we might need some help figuring it out. And the very first place we should look to help us understand anything we read in the Bible is the Bible. Now, there are millions of books, websites, and videos, thousands of Bible teachers of all shapes and theologies, hundreds of doctrinal statements, commentaries, and catechisms, and handfuls of classic religious and historical works like Calvin, Luther, the Talmud, and Josephus. And they all have something to say about the Bible. But even though some of these resources can be helpful at times, and some of them not at all, not a single one of them to any degree whatsoever, can claim what it says about the scriptures in 2 Timothy 3.16, every scripture is God-breathed. Only the words of scripture have God as their ultimate author. Therefore, only scripture can have the first and last word on everything it has to say. Despite what we sometimes see in the word at first blush, we can be confident in knowing that scripture doesn't contradict scripture any more than God contradicts himself. Yeshua won't contradict Moses, and Moses won't contradict Paul. This means that if we come across any given passage that appears to be in disagreement with another, it's our understanding, not the Bible, that's wrong. While we need to be able to accept certain tensions and even paradoxes that are beyond full human comprehension, when we find what seem to be outright contradictions, it means that we, not the scriptures, are in error. This is part and parcel of the fundamental belief that the scriptures are the only written, true, perfect word of God. So whenever there's something in the Bible we don't understand or something we just want to learn more about, the first place we need to go, and often, if we do it right, the only place is scripture itself. You see, the scriptures rarely speak on a subject in just a single place. So if something we read raises a question in our minds, there are almost always going to be other places in the scriptures that, when considered all together, will clarify and bring full understanding. As for the teachings from other believers who have gone before us, some of them will likely at some point be necessary for us to know to help give us clarity. God did, after all, provide the gift of teachers, Ephesians chapter 4. But it's our own familiarity and experience with the Bible that we need to first pursue. I've said it before, the Bible is simple to understand, though not necessarily easy without some work. No doubt we'll have to make use of the kind of Bible study tools we talked about in episode 15, but the only purpose of those tools is to help us navigate the Word. It's the Word of God itself which provides the answers. A great biblical example of this is found in Acts chapter 17, verses 2, 3, and 11, which record how Paul reasoned with the people from the scriptures, opening them up and citing that, This is the Messiah, Yeshua, whom I proclaim to you. And many in the Berean synagogue received the word with all readiness of mind, every day examining the scriptures to find out whether those things were so. And without any assistance from extra-biblical books or commentaries or YouTube videos or biblically correct podcasts, the Berean Jews managed to find the information they needed in the scriptures themselves just fine. Now, what we can't do is use scripture explaining scripture as a cover for cherry-picking or proof-texting. Cherry-picking is the practice of ignoring or dismissing relevant passages that oppose a point you're trying to make— or a doctrine you're trying to defend, and only using verses that appear to support your position. Proof texting uses isolated and sometimes unrelated out-of-context verses to support a belief or doctrine. 
So both cherry-picking and proof-texting have to disregard the whole counsel of Scripture in order to survive. They can both seem like they're following the principle of explaining Scripture with Scripture, but when you dig deeper into the Word, you find their flaws. And of course, you'll be able to recognize these and other misuses of Scripture much faster the more you know the Word. The principle then of explaining Scripture with Scripture is actually related to context, which I covered in episode 9. Remember that context is the surrounding words, phrases, sentences, verses, chapters, and books of the Bible, which we need to take into account in order to fully understand the verse or passage that we're reading. Context isn't only essential for learning, but necessary for the correction of misunderstandings based on bad doctrine or preconceptions. So when we talk about understanding the Bible in context, we're most often referring to the immediately surrounding context. If we're trying to understand a specific word or verse, we'll start by looking at the preceding and following verses and paragraphs. By contrast, explaining Scripture with Scripture often involves covering a lot more territory. And if you go back to episode 9, I actually start to demonstrate this in the latter half of the episode. In today's teaching, you'll see context also coming into play, but I won't be focusing on the immediate text. We'll be moving around a little bit more. So for the rest of today's teaching, I want to simply walk through a few examples of Scripture explaining Scripture using three somewhat confusing yet really intriguing topics not only to show you some of the ways you can put this principle into practice, but also to reinforce the importance of looking to Scripture first, and often, Scripture only. Now, with all that being said, let's take a look at our first example, which I call, God Tells Peter to Have a Ham Sandwich. This is an illustration of explaining Scripture with Scripture from within the same passage. Now, according to the Torah, God forbade Israel from eating certain animals as a way of setting them apart from the nations. And Peter, Kepha, as a Jew, would have known not to eat any of them. And he never did. So one day, as recorded in Acts chapter 10, Kepha was waiting for his lunch to be made, and it says, beginning at the end of verse 10, there came upon him a trance, and he saw the heaven opened, and a certain thing descending, like a large linen sheet, being let down upon the ground at the four corners, in which were all the kinds of four-footed animals and creeping things of the earth and the birds of the heaven. So in this vision, he's seeing all kinds of animals, including those which were forbidden for him to eat, and they were being let down from the sky in a big sheet. Continuing in verse 13, And a voice came to him, Having risen, Kepha, kill and eat. And Kepha said, Not so, master, because at no time did I ever eat anything unholy and unclean. So in the vision, Kepha rebukes the voice, telling him to eat the unclean animals, since that wouldn't be kosher. It would be against the Torah. Then, continuing in verse 15, And there was a voice again a second time, saying to him, What God cleansed you must not declare unholy. And this was done three times, and immediately the thing was received up to the heaven. And Kepha was perplexed in himself as to what the vision that he saw might be. So three times in the vision, the voice told Kepha to eat unclean animals. And three times, he rejected the idea. But when the vision was over, he was confused. Presumably because the vision was telling him that these unclean animals were now kosher. God had cleansed them, so Kepha should not continue to declare them unholy. But Kepha clearly wasn't confused for long, because he realized that now that he was a Christian, he was no longer under the law and immediately went downstairs and asked them to make him a BLT. Right? Or maybe it was a ham and cheese on rye. We don't know. Now, that didn't happen, did it? He was confused by the vision because in it, God was telling him to do what was in clear conflict with the word. So here's where we need Scripture to explain Scripture to us. Is there anywhere in the Word that might address this apparent contradiction? And indeed there is. About 12 verses later, where Kepha is in the home of Cornelius, a Gentile. Immediately after receiving the vision, the Holy Spirit told Kepha to go to the house of Cornelius. And after he arrived, he began by acknowledging the purely cultural norm of Jews not associating with Gentiles. 
It wasn't something commanded in Scripture. It just simply wasn't done because of how Jews perceived Gentiles. And in verse 28, Kepha finally explains what the vision meant, saying, You know how illicit it is for a man, a Yehudi, a Jew, to keep company with or to come to visit one from another nation. But God showed me not to call any man unholy or unclean. So the voice had been saying to Kepha in the vision, What God cleansed, you must not declare unholy. And at some point in relation to his visit with Cornelius, Kepha came to understand that God was telling him not to call any man, specifically Gentiles, unholy or unclean. The scripture in verse 28 then explains the scriptures in verses 10 through 16. The vision wasn't really about food at all, but about people. It's actually very similar to how Joseph's dreams in Genesis 37 about sheaves and stars were really about his family. It's the same type of thing. Using the striking imagery of a vision, God was telling Kepha to stop considering the people of the nations as unacceptable recipients of the message of the Messiah of Israel. And Kepha says as much, beginning in verse 34. I take hold of the truth that God is no acceptor of faces, but in every ethnic group, in other words, among both Jews and Gentiles, he who is fearing him and is putting righteousness into action is acceptable to him. And that, my friend, is very, very good news. So that was an example of Scripture explaining Scripture from within the same passage. There was no need to theorize about what the vision meant or to impose an anti-Jewish, anti-Torah understanding on it. In this case, just continuing to read the chapter made the meaning clear. The vision wasn't about food, but people. Scripture explained Scripture very nicely indeed. Let's move on now to our second example. This one I call, That Time Yeshua Taught Us to Hate. This example illustrates explaining Scripture with Scripture using parallel passages. Parallel passages are generally going to be found only in the historical writings, where the same event is recorded by different authors or in different books. They're parallel in that you can look at them side by side and see that they're referring to the same incident, but the differences in the accounts can help bring a more well-rounded picture to what actually happened or a fuller understanding of what is being said. And this is the case with a rather off-putting word from Yeshua, which at first blush may seem completely out of character. In Luke chapter 14, verses 26 through 27, the master teaches us, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yet even his own life, he is not able to be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own execution stake and come after me is not able to be my disciple. Now, that seems wrong, doesn't it? How can the Son of God, the God who is love, tell us to hate our loved ones? And yet, that's exactly what the Greek means here, to hate. It's the same word as in John chapter 3, verse 20, when Yeshua says, For everyone who is doing wicked things hates the light. And in John 7, 7, where he says, The world is not able to hate you, but it does hate me. The word here in Luke really is hate. Yeshua is literally and actually telling us to hate our families. And he's saying this in the context of what we need to do to be his disciples. He's saying that if we don't hate our families, we're unable to follow him. Now, aside from this being fodder for Christian cults, we can't just find this word strange and aberrant and just dismiss it. What Yeshua is telling us here directly impacts our ability to follow him and be his disciple. And unless you're only interested in how God can serve you, then you should be concerned with understanding this verse. And again, here's where Scripture explaining Scripture comes to our rescue, because there just so happens to be a parallel passage to these verses in Matityahu, Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 38, where Yeshua says, He who is loving his father or mother above me is not worthy of me. And he who is loving his son or daughter above me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his execution stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. Now, the language obviously isn't identical, but look at the content of what's being said. 
In both passages, the one in Luke and the one in Matthew, Yeshua is singling out family members as a hindrance or obstacle to following him. Now let's look at the differences. In Luke, Yeshua tells us to hate our families to be able to follow him. In Matthew, he tells us that loving our families above him makes us unworthy to follow him. Both statements, if we do what he says, have the same net result. If we hate our families and follow Yeshua, we're putting him first. And if we love Yeshua above our families, we're still putting him first. So the scripture in Matthew, then, explains the scripture in Luke. And when we consider the two parallel passages together, we see the bigger picture about the gravity and sacrifice of following Yeshua. It requires a commitment and zeal that's so dedicated and single-minded that compared to our love for Yeshua, the closest thing that would describe our love for our families is hate. This is Yeshua's point, made in what now appears to be extremely hyperbolic language. He doesn't want us to miss the seriousness of what it means to be his disciple. He's putting our intense devotion to him into severe perspective. To hate our families, then, means to love Yeshua above our parents, spouses, children, and even ourselves. And while this kind of love won't create any friction between family members who all share the same love and commitment to the master, it is supposed to divide families who don't. That's the context of the surrounding verses. Now, that doesn't mean that following Yeshua requires or even suggests that we separate ourselves from unbelieving family members by default. Nevertheless, the Master is teaching us that nothing can come between us and our ability to follow Him. Nothing, including our loved ones, can come between us and our purpose to live according to the Scriptures and to share His truth and love with the world. And that's an example of Scripture explaining Scripture using parallel passages. We didn't need to ignore or dismiss something Yeshua said that seemed irreconcilable, but were able to fully understand not what he was trying to say, but what he actually said, bouncing it with what he also said in a parallel passage. And finally, let's take on an age-old debate in our last example, which I call, Faith versus Works is Dead. This is an illustration of Scripture explaining Scripture using multiple passages from different places in the Bible, including multiple authors. So this will be a very, very brief look at the divergent doctrines of salvation by faith alone versus salvation by faith plus works. The idea that doing good deeds is necessary for salvation versus salvation being a completely unearned gift received only by faith. Instead of using the archaic term works, I'll be using the word actions, which is what the concept of works means in today's English. So the idea that good actions are necessary for salvation basically starts with Yaakov, Jacob, or James, when he poses the question in chapter 2, verse 14, what is the profit, my brothers, if anyone speaks of having faith, but he does not have actions? Is that faith able to save him? So in this verse, Yaakov appears to be questioning the value of faith without the actions that flow from that faith and whether it leads to salvation. Then he proceeds to answer his own question, continuing in verse 15. If a brother or sister is naked and lacking of the daily food, and any one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, but gives not to them the things needful for the body, what is the profit to that person's life? so also the faith by itself, if it does not have actions, is dead. So this is Yaakov's point, that our faith in Messiah should result in actions, such as taking care of the needs of others, rather than just saying, I'll pray for you, and then wishing them well. His answer is that faith by itself, without the actions that go with it, is dead. In other words, an inactive faith doesn't save. And he goes on, to offer evidence to this effect, beginning in verse 21. Avraham, Abraham, our father, was he not declared righteous by actions, having brought up Yitzchak, Isaac, his son, upon the altar? 
do you see that the faith was working with his actions? And by the actions, the faith was perfected. And fulfilled was the scripture that is saying, and Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him, to righteousness. You see then that by actions is man declared righteous, and not by faith only. Faith apart from actions is dead. So this is important because Yaakov has shifted a little, and now he's speaking about being declared righteous, or in archaic terms, being justified. Being declared righteous isn't identical with salvation, but related, because it has to do with our standing before God and how we'll be judged by him. So we need to be declared righteous in order to be saved. So Yaakov here, by invoking Abraham and his faith in action, is saying that it's not only by faith that we're declared righteous, but by our actions. And then he reiterates, faith apart from actions is dead. This is his main point. So all that seems pretty reasonable and not all that controversial until we stumble upon Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, where he says, For we consider a man to be declared righteous by faith apart from actions of Torah. And now we're in the thick of it. We just heard Yaakov say that by actions is man declared righteous and not by faith only, so faith plus actions. But here, Paul says, we consider a man to be declared righteous by faith apart from actions, faith alone. And this is why there are two camps on this issue. So now we need to start seeing some scripture explaining scripture, because at this point, we have two hopelessly contradictory assertions. Let's start by letting Paul flesh out his thoughts a little more. Now, as if Paul's statement wasn't enough to upset the apple cart, he also uses Abraham to make his point using the same scripture that Yaakov used. In Romans 4.2, he says, For if Avraham was declared righteous by actions, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And Avraham believed God, and it was credited to him, to righteousness. So both Yaakov and Paul use the exact same scripture, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, but appear to be drawing the exact opposite conclusions. Yaakov says that Avraham was declared righteous by his actions, and Paul implies that he wasn't, but instead by faith. As the scripture says, Abraham believed God and righteousness was credited to him. Now, wait a minute. The verse they're both using to make their apparently opposing points says only one thing, that it was because of Abraham's belief or faith that God credited righteousness to him. How can Yaakov then claim it was by actions? Why would Yaakov use a verse to support his point that clearly doesn't? The answer is because neither Yaakov nor Paul are trying to make a point about salvation. They're both making different and separate points about actions. And here's where Scripture explaining Scripture is so important, because Yaakov and Paul don't actually disagree about how our actions affect our declared righteousness. As we see earlier in Romans, in chapter 2, verse 13, Paul literally says that it is not the hearers of Torah who are righteous before God, but the doers of Torah who will be declared righteous righteous. The context of Paul's entire discussion in Romans about faith versus actions is that it's aimed at Jewish believers who are doing the Torah legalistically in order to be declared righteous, which Paul flatly condemns throughout his writings. But that doesn't negate the doing of the Torah itself, which when done in faith, in other words, with the right heart, does declare the doer righteous, as he says in chapter 2. By contrast, Yaakov's discussion isn't about Torah keeping, but about having common sense decency and helping people. And that if we have a faith in Messiah that is alive, it will make itself evident through our actions. His goal isn't to make a commentary on true faith and whether or not it brings salvation without actions. He's saying that if we have a faith that doesn't result in actions, then it's not a living faith, but a dead one. In other words, Yaakov and Paul are both discussing faith, actions, declared righteousness, and to some extent, salvation. But their main points 
are completely different. They're not arguing with each other about salvation and defending opposing opinions. They're making two different points with two separate audiences. So in a very real way, the disagreement over salvation by faith only versus salvation by faith plus actions is somewhat manufactured. Because when we continue to use Scripture to explain Scripture, we find a very clear statement about how we are saved and what roles faith and actions play in relation to that salvation. Paul explains it to us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by unmerited favor or grace, you are having been saved through faith, and this not of something you did. It is the gift of God, not of your actions, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good actions, which God prepared beforehand so that in them we may walk. This scripture by Paul explains and puts into fuller perspective Yaakov's declaration that faith without actions is dead. Salvation is through faith. We aren't saved because of the things we do. Because if salvation weren't a free gift from God, then we would be able to boast. And given who Paul is specifically addressing at this point in Romans, it's worth noting that the prophet says to Judah in Isaiah 64, 6, and we were as unclean, all of us, and all our righteous acts as a menstruation garment. So this very visual illustration from Isaiah about righteous acts adds another biblical voice to the explanation. So the scriptures in Romans and Ephesians and Isaiah then explain the scripture in Yaakov. And when we consider all these passages together, what we find is that we're saved by God's grace, by his showing us favor that we didn't earn, which is through faith and not at all a result of our actions. However, in that faith, we have been recreated in the Messiah Yeshua for what? For good actions. Out of our faith should flow the good actions that back it up, that demonstrate our faith in Messiah in the things we do. So when we say we have faith, but don't have the actions that go with them, then we have a faith that doesn't save, because that faith isn't true or real or alive. A living faith in the Messiah must result in real actions. We're saved by faith apart from our actions, but our actions or lack of actions demonstrate the kind of faith we truly have. And that is an example of Scripture explaining Scripture using multiple passages and multiple authors. When we were focused on only a couple of verses, we found Paul and Yaakov to be telling us two completely contradictory things. But by broadening our scope and looking at multiple passages, we found that the points that the two writers were making weren't in conflict at all, but actually ended up complementing each other and giving us a fuller picture on salvation, faith, and actions. We didn't have to consult books on theology or come up with creative solutions to explain the apparent contradictions or study the various doctrines as put forth by different denominations and faith traditions. All we had to do was look at the verses in context and let the multiple passages of Scripture explain themselves. The practice of explaining Scripture with Scripture by continuing to read within the same passage or considering parallel passages, and especially consulting multiple passages throughout the entire book, is founded on the belief that God is the ultimate author of the Bible. This means that not only can we trust every single thing it says because God is perfect, but that Scripture doesn't contradict Scripture and is therefore the only reliable and trustworthy interpreter of itself. When we allow Scripture to explain Scripture, not misusing it by acknowledging only the parts that fit our beliefs, but seeking out and accepting the whole counsel of Scripture. We're listening to God speak the truth to us and allowing Him to correct our misunderstandings. Since the Bible is the only written, true, perfect Word of God, whenever we find what appears to be contradictions, it's our understanding, not the Bible, that's wrong. And we just need to set aside our ideas and trust what the Word says. So when you don't understand something in the Bible, don't just default to doctrine 
or defer to someone else. Because the first place and often the only place we need to go is the Bible itself and to let the scriptures be explained to us by scripture. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Biblically Correct Podcast. If you like this episode and want to see us make more, then we need your help. Visit our website at biblicallycorrectpodcast.org to support the work of Perfect Word Ministries and MJMI with your much-needed donations. And of course, don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications whenever a new episode is posted. If you have any questions about this teaching, or if there are any other topics you'd like to see me cover, leave me a comment or shoot me an email at kevin at perfectword.org. That's kevin at perfectword.org. Until next time, remember that every scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for refuting, for setting a right, and for instruction that is in righteousness, so that the man of God may be fully equipped, having been completed for every good act. Shalom.